Our presentation of the gospel must clearly show that it has specific relevance to life now as well as hereafter. For secularized man is far more concerned with the present than the future. So, if you would interest anyone in this work, first appeal to what they can do here and now. For the promise is so fantastic that they may turn from you in disgust. Show them what can be done right here in this world now, and then you'll get their interest. Then you might find them becoming more and more interested in the promise. Now here let me share with you a couple of stories that came to me this week. You'll see why I tell you this. He's not here tonight, but he's here quite often. And he wrote these two stories. He said, about 10 days ago, my wife told me of this little girl, 14 months old. My wife is a very dear friend of the grandmother of this little girl. And the little girl had cancer. She developed certain lumps in her neck, took her to the hospital, and a little biopsy was made of the tissues, and they brought back the verdict, cancer. Another doctor looked at it, and he questioned it. He wasn't quite sure, not convinced, so there was a difference of opinion there. Then they brought in three specialists separately. Each brought in the verdict, cancer. So here were four and one, not quite convinced, but they kept the child in the hospital for further examination. Now this night, 10 days ago, his wife told him the story. He said, I sat there and I listened to much of the story and then I tuned her out to the point where I couldn't even hear what she was saying. I reconstructed the entire story in my mind's eye and redid it along the lines that I wanted to hear. And I actually heard my wife's voice telling me an entirely different story. As she was telling me the story, I completely revised it at a certain point. Then that night, when I was completely alone and not distracted, I redid the whole thing to make myself convinced. And to be sure, I actually heard my wife's voice telling me the revised story. The child was kept in the hospital, and then they made another test from another lump in the neck, and a unanimous vote was brought in. The child does not have cancer, and therefore, because they had no remedial treatment done in the hospital, she never had cancer. They couldn't conceive of any other treatment. They did not give her any radium, gave her nothing, no injections. Therefore, they were 100% wrong. They confessed the first time because without treatment, the child could never have overcome the condition. So, when the wife heard the new verdict of a complete change in the little 14-month-old child, she told the mother and the grandmother what her husband had done. Meanwhile, the neighborhood has been told this, and they are agog, but they can't for one moment credit an imaginal act as causation. That imagining creates reality is the height of insanity. Nevertheless, this is his story. That as every mystic knows that every natural effect has a spiritual cause and not a natural one. A natural cause only seems, and it is a delusion of this world. And man has a very, very poor memory. He can't relate what's taking place to any imaginal act in his past because he's looking for physical causation. And he cannot believe that he did anything that would have produced this, not knowing that the doing was imaginal, not physical. He sat alone and he imagined and he set in motion a cause. And when the cause came into the world and he saw the effects, he did not go back into the psychic state of his being. He went back into the physical state. And he can't remember where he ever did physically anything worthy of this thing that he is now reaping. So, his imagination is setting the whole thing in motion 
but his memory is faulty and that is the vegetating memory that simply disintegrates because it isn't really. So he looks upon the man who claims that it is all imagination as a fool. As Blake said, the idiot reasoner laughs at the man of imagination. So I tell you, everything in your world is caused by an imaginal act. Now he said, I was driving home and suddenly I thought, here comes April the 15th and I could use a little more cash. Uncle Sam is making demands upon my income so I could use a little more. Then, in my imagination, I simply imagined that lovely, green, crisp currency was raining upon me, gently raining upon me. And then, for about a minute, I simply lost myself in this little shower of green currency. Then the traffic demanded my complete attention, so I dropped it instantly and came back to this world. It only took about a minute, if a minute. And then I continued home in my normal alert state. I never thought about it again. On the morning of the 15th, my boss came into the office and he said to me, you will receive a 10% raise in salary retroactive to April the 1st, and then gave me a check retroactive with a 10% increase in salary. Now, he said, I simply took this green currency falling gently upon me. But let me warn you tonight, wait till you get home to do it if you're driving the highway. Be alert while you're driving. You can do it just as well while you're reclining in your bed, preparing yourself for sleep. Or do it when you are sitting down in a chair. But it works. This actually works. Everything is an imaginal act. There is no such thing as a physical causation. It's imaginal. But the world will not accept it. We are looked upon as simply idiots. And they laugh at the man of imagination when he tells you that everything in this world is caused by some mental act. Well, try to disprove it. You can say that man struck so-and-so, and therefore that was a physical cause. And the blow that he received, that was the effect. And therefore the whole thing was simply constructed physically. It wasn't so. What preceded the impulse to strike him? You go back to an unseen cause, and it was an imaginal act. The whole vast world is brought into being by imagination, sustained in being by imagination. And when imagination no longer sustains it, it dissolves and leaves not a trace behind, not a trace. So here, one must approach this gospel on this level first, and you get their interest on this level so that they prove it in the testing. As my friend proved it, he received a 10% raise retroactive to the first of the month. And then the little girl, 14 months old, instead of having cancer as five doctors agreed, and then they changed their opinion. But to justify their false judgment, they had to admit it wasn't so in the beginning because nothing was given to her. There was no treatment and unless treatment was given, it could not have ever been cancer, therefore, it never was. Well, that's all right with him. It's perfectly all right. The child has not received any verdict by the doctors of cancer. Now you'll say, how can a little girl, 14 months old, why should she suffer? To you, she is 14 months old. To you, she isn't any 14 months old. The garment she wears, judged by human standards, is 14 months old, but not the little girl that is there. She's old as God himself, and God has no beginning, no end. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, not when she came out of her mother's womb, but before the foundation of the world. Before physical creation, you and I were chosen in him for a purpose. Now, without that purpose, without that meaning, what would it matter if you this night owned the entire world 
and there was no meaning to it. And death closed the book, and that was fine. Well, many a tyrant believes that. You can't blame him for being a tyrant. If he really believes it, well then, how can you blame him? Who wouldn't do just what he did if you really believe that death ends it all? Shakespeare in his Macbeth is perfectly right. A tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That's what it would have to be if there were no promise, no purpose, no meaning behind the entire thing. So the promise comes in then, after you get their interest, and they can test it and prove it in performance. When you can prove it in performance, then you can give them the most incredible story in the world and hope that they will believe you or begin to believe you. Nothing that is said of Jesus, not a thing about Jesus is proven outwardly, but nothing. Only the visionaries know him. He who this dark body, this mask, they see what a friend who walks the earth with them, clothed in flesh, tells them that he had experienced. So a man or a woman suddenly has this entire drama rapidly unfold within him or within her and takes friends into his or her confidence and tells them that these things happened to me. Now, you know I'm not dead, and yet, do you know I know what it is to be crucified? And they listen attentively and then to be buried, and then to be resurrected. Now believe me, and in time, I'll prove it to you. And then, in your heavenly wanderings, you choose one to whom you give your immortal eyes that are turned inward, not outward. And then you reveal the drama, and she sees you buried on a cross burned to the ground, and the golden liquid light that is just a residue of the entire thing, just as you told her it has happened to you. Now, you could not in eternity persuade her that she did not have that experience, any more than you could persuade the man who told her the story that he did not have the experience. So she knows who Jesus is, seeing behind and beyond the mask of her friend, who is fragile, who has all the weaknesses of the flesh, all the limitations of the flesh. She goes beyond the mask through vision and sees who Jesus really is. Well then, who is Jesus? He has made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, that he may unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. F.H. Weiss 1-9 Therefore, who is Jesus? He is the plan. The plan is in man. That plan suddenly erupted in a man, and he happened to be a friend of a few who would listen to him. And they believed him in a way and hoped he was telling the truth. Well, he told them of another aspect of this principle that they could verify on this level. They tried it and it worked. Then in the fullness of time, he gave his eyes and still kept them. For in the heavenly sphere, you keep what you give. Therefore, you only share it. You don't really lose possession of it. So she has the immortal eyes that she may see inward into the world of thought, into eternity. And then she sees her friend on a cross set of flame and reduced to molten gold as he told her that it happened to him. Now she knows because she received the eyes that could look inward. Now, only the visionaries know, actually know who Jesus is. For not in eternity, no matter how you search, will you have any proof externally of Jesus. For he is not of this world. He's entirely different. We are from below, we are told, and he is from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. John 8, 23. So why look for him in this world? And yet throughout the history of man, they have been looking for him in the Near East. And then those who do not know, who have not the vision, say this is the spot 
where he was crucified. And that's the spot where he was buried. And this is the robe that he wore. And that is a piece of wood that came from the cross on which he was nailed. They build up this fantastic tradition. As we are told in the 15th chapter of Matthew, the traditions of our fathers have voided the word of God, 15.6. The word of God has completely gone from you because of the traditions of your fathers. You have kept these traditions alive, believing in a physical Jesus. And it's not a physical Jesus at all. Jesus is the pattern buried in every man, and it suddenly erupts in the fullness of time. The one in whom it erupts is just as surprised as anyone could be. And he simply tells it, still remaining in his little weak garment, the garment that is very weak and still subject to all the temptations of the world. But he can't deny what has happened to him. So he tells it. Then he gives to one who in turn gives it to another, who will in turn give it to another, and they all become in scriptura eyewitnesses. So when Luke begins his story, he said, in as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, not the hope that have been accomplished among us, just as they were presented to us by those who were from the beginning eyewitnesses. And then he adds the thought, and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also to write a narrative concerning these things of which we have been informed. 114. So he is now going to tell the one who loves God. He is called Theophilus, O oh dear, or blessed Theophilus. He's now going to tell him the truth of these things because of the eyewitnesses. Now in time, the eyewitnesses depart this world and then the ministers of the word multiply. They haven't seen, they haven't seen what the eyewitnesses saw. So they depart this world, leaving only the ministers of the word. And they never knew the eyewitnesses friend when he walked in flesh, whose story they witnessed because he gave them his eyes to see what had happened to him. And so they witnessed the drama as it unfolded within him. But then comes the inevitable departure from this world. So they all vanish, including the one who had the experience, leaving only now the ministers of the word. And they build an organization which is so completely unlike what actually happened. Then they make a little God out of a being who was like all the other beings in the world, only it erupted in him. They speak nothing of the eruption. They speak of an external man, and there is no such thing as an external being. There never was. He is the inner man, the new man. You can look from now till the ends of time, and you will never find any convincing evidence of the historicity of one called Jesus. Yet he is the most real, the most true being in the world, for he is in every being in the world. Christ in you is the hope of glory, Colo 1, 27. And do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail to meet the test, 2 Cor 13, 5. So you begin to test on this level with his power called the law, so that you can actually bring all things to pass. Like my friend, who simply allowed crisp, crisp bills, not debt, but currency to fall upon him. And having received it like a gentle shower, then, in a matter of days, the boss comes in and tells him a 10% raise has been voted for him, and it's retroactive. So, his so-called immediate problem has been solved. But now it continues. It wasn't just for the month. This now continues as long as he is employed by this company. From what I have been told, they certainly do want him in their employment. So you start, if you're going to tell this story, you start by telling it on this level. 
and show that it has a specific relevance to life now and do not start in the hereafter. You can bring them into that afterwards, but bring them first into the working of the law. Do not allow anything in this world to confront you with something impossible. Nothing is impossible to imagination and the whole thing is done in imagination. So you are not responsible as a reasoning being to make it so. You simply imagine that it is so. My friend who told me the story, what did he know about cancer? If he saw the cancer under the microscope, what is called cancer? He wouldn't recognize it. He doesn't know a thing about the human body any more than I do, but he would know what his wife would tell him if the verdict were reversed. And so now she goes out trying to convert the grandmother and the mother of the child to the belief that imagining does create reality. Well, she has a task. They are going to believe the wise doctors that she never had it anyway, that they were wrong in their diagnosis. She could not have shown it under the microscope and then in a matter of days, say within two or three weeks, to show no evidence that it was ever present. That was impossible, therefore she never had it. Not that she had it, and an imaginal act dissipated it. Oh no, because they can't believe in causation as mental. Causation must be under that microscope as a little physical thing. Though you can't see it with a normal eye, you can see it with the extended eye of the microscope, and therefore, it is still physical. So the entire structure has to be physical for them. They take it now, put the little biopsy, the little tissue, and go right down with their aid, the microscope, and they see what is called a cancer cell. Then 10 days or three weeks later, they don't see the cancer cell, therefore, they could not have seen accurately the first time. They know nothing of my friend's attitude toward life, that the whole thing is imaginal. Since he started coming here, he has gone up and up and up by simply imagining. He doesn't burst a blood vessel. He simply tuned out his wife's voice as it was coming through, going beyond the point he wanted to hear. He heard enough that the little child, 14 months old, had cancer confirmed by all the doctors, and there were five. Only one question. He didn't deny, only question. But three experts, all coming in singly, not together, each went out on the limb and said it was cancer. So there were four against one for cancer. But he tuned her out and simply reconstructed the entire drama in his mind's ear and listen to his wife's voice that he knows well, completely changing the entire picture and tells him what he wanted her to say. He heard it distinctly. That was all that he did. And that word of his could not return unto him void. It had to accomplish that which he purposed and bring it into fulfillment. He determined that. Well, then he did not a thing. He knows nothing of the human body. He did nothing but remain faithful to that imaginal act. And the verdict came in. So I ask you to try it. Try it and then turn to your neighbor in a quiet way and ask if they ever thought that their imaginal acts are causative. You might get a little wedge in that way. Did it ever occur to you that the things that are happening to you in your world are caused not by the obvious, but caused by some unseen imaginal act. Well, you know, you may interest them that way, and then having received their interest for a moment, then you can ask them to try it. You can construct a scene for them and have that scene come to pass in their world. If it is duplicated and repeated again, and it works, well then, you've got them. They know nothing of my friend's attitude toward life, that the whole thing is imaginal. 
Since he started coming here, he has gone up and up and up by simply imagining. He doesn't burst a blood vessel. He simply tuned out his wife's voice as it was coming through, going beyond the point he wanted to hear. He heard enough that the little child, 14 months old, had cancer confirmed by all the doctors, and there were five. Only one question. He didn't deny, only question. But three experts, all coming in singly, not together. Each went out on the limb and said it was cancer. So there were four against one for cancer. But he tuned her out and simply reconstructed the entire drama in his mind's eye and listened to his wife's voice that he knows well, completely changing the entire picture and tells him what he wanted her to say. He heard it distinctly. That was all that he did. And that word of his could not return unto him void. It had to accomplish that which he purposed and bring it into fulfillment. He determined that. Well, then he did not a thing. He knows nothing of the human body. He did nothing but remain faithful to that imaginal act. And the verdict came in. So I ask you to try it. Try it and then turn to your neighbor in a quiet way and ask if they ever thought that their imaginal acts are causative. You might get a little wedge in that way. Did it ever occur to you that the things that are happening to you in your world are caused not by the obvious, but caused by some unseen imaginal act? Well, you know, you may interest them that way. And then having received their interest for a moment, then you can ask them to try it. You can construct a scene for them and have that scene come to pass in their world. If it is duplicated and repeated again, and it works, well then, you've got them. But you tell this to someone who would rather be the same little thing restored, something that they must carry to the bathroom several times a day and perform all the normal functions themselves and perpetuate that forever. Can you imagine such hell? No. That's not the body that you're going to wear. You're going to wear the body that is the body of God himself, for you're destined to awaken as that form. But while you're in the world of Caesar, don't neglect the law. Don't treat it lightly. Use it every moment of time, and there's not a thing in this world beyond your ability to imagine. It's not your responsibility in this world to make it so. You simply imagine that it is so and let it be so, and then in a way that no one knows, it is crystallizing itself into this world and becoming a fact. That is the world in which we live. Now, before you judge it, I ask you to try it. It would be stupid to pass judgment on something that you haven't tested. And so many people do that. They will say, I don't like that. Have you ever had it? No, but I know I won't like it. Well, you can acquire a taste for anything. I know the first time I had an oyster, it was on the little island of St. Croix. In those days, we spoke of it as Santa Cruz. It was owned by the Danes. Mother told me, when I left Barbados to go to Santa Cruz, to watch what other people did, because they were a different people and therefore they ate differently, and they ate different foods that I didn't know. I was only 11 years old. She said, you watch. In those days, there were no hotels, only rooming houses, and so you sat down at the same common table. If there were 20 rumors, well then, there were 20 rumors, and the man and the wife who ran the place sat with us and they conducted the whole thing. Well, in Santa Cruz, where I am, it's 1916. They're all speaking Danska. They're all Danish. And I couldn't understand one word, but I could observe what they were doing. And so the dinner started off and they were all around the table 
And here before me were these six little things on shelves. Never saw one before. Mother said to watch what the host did. So she took this little fork, something I never saw before either, little tiny fork. She first put all these little condiments on the thing. Then she took the fork and stuck it into the, and then that face was like heaven, what she anticipated. When she got it into her mouth, it satisfied her. And it was simply consummation of that glory. Well, I expected the same thing. I did the same thing and stuck it into my mouth. It wouldn't go down and I couldn't bring it up. It just couldn't, can't expect to rate it. Mother said that after all, you couldn't spit it out. No matter what happens, if I die, I have to swallow it and it wouldn't go down. Finally, when I swallowed, then I looked down and I must have turned green. There were five more to go and I couldn't say no. I had to actually put these things together and swallow it. And then down they would go. Well, today I love oysters, love them. When I go to New York, we get these lovely oysters. Every dinner, I precede my meal with either oysters or the little clams, the little neck. Not the cherry stone, not my favorite, but the little neck. They're limited in supply, and that's what I order, or the oysters. And here, today, I thoroughly enjoy them. I can enjoy an oyster in any form. I prefer it in its raw state, but give it to me fried. Give it to me oysters Rockefeller, anyway. I had my first experience at the age of 11. So you can acquire a taste for anything in this world. So you can acquire a taste for the word of God, but introduce them first with the law and tell them how it works and then show them how it works. Ask them to repeat it. No matter how difficult the problem, let them confront it with this principle. Then slowly get over. Do you know who Jesus really is? Well, naturally, he's going to say yes because he's a Christian. So he believes he knows exactly who Jesus is. This eunuch son of Mary who had no father, but the father was God. He was physical and he came out of Mary's womb. That's what they're going to tell you. One billion Christians will tell you that story. That's what I was told. Then you will say, you know, I know a friend of mine, and he's a normal person, not formally educated, no, doesn't have any of these qualifications, completely unknown, just a normal person, married, in fact, he was once divorced, so he has a family, a son from the first, and a daughter from the second. Right away they'll close the book, if you're going to tell me anything about him, and associate it in any way with spirituality. But, nevertheless, you go on and you say, you know what, everything said of Jesus Christ in the Gospels he experienced. And you know what, a friend of mine, just as normal as he is, she too has been married twice. And she has two children from two different men. And one night in vision, he gave to her his immortal eyes that she may see. And then she saw the same one, as he told her he had experienced it, hanging on a cross, and the cross set aflame and reduced to molten golden liquid light. And they were digging a hole to put the body, and she saw the body on a litter, on a pallet. She has seen him on other occasions, manifesting the power he tells you. He now exercises when the body sleeps upon the bed. So she knows who Jesus really is. No, he is not that little garment. Jesus is a pattern, an eternal pattern of redemption, which sleeps in every garment. But in that particular garment, he awoke. And now he knows who he is, because when he awakes, the one in whom he awakes is the one who awakes. And so he became humanity, that humanity may become God. So God sleeps in everyone, and in everyone he will awake. 
And as he awakes, the identical drama has to be experienced by the one in whom he awakes. So that is Jesus. And there never was another Jesus. There is no other Jesus. Now, if they are very ardent, they may turn from you even though they become enriched by the law that you taught them. Perfectly all right. It takes quite a while to break down these traditions. But you go back and you read it in the 15th chapter of the book of Matthew. How for the sake of your traditions, you have made void the word of God. So they'll keep alive all of these things and wear all these silly little garments on the outside with their purple robes and their red robes and all these things and hats so heavy they can't even hold them up. Here they are. They think that makes them very, very important. And the unthinking millions will think themselves blessed if they can, but touch the garment as he walks by, or if he will smile on them, of if they can even attend service where he, the Great One, is conducting the Mass. They firmly believe this nonsense, and they go blindly on doing it morning, noon, and night. But I'm telling you what I know from experience. You take it seriously because at my age, even if I lived on for a few years, it can't be that long and I must depart. And those of you who would have seen as I have told you that you will see will depart too. And when the eyewitnesses depart, they only leave behind them the ministers of the word and they invariably turn it into some institutional concept and therefore void the word of God, completely void it. But you take me seriously and start tonight. Of course, you've already done it with the law and prove it. And you'll prove it. You'll become exactly the man, the woman that you want to be. But don't forget the promise in the proving of the law. For without the promise, what would it matter if you owned the ear? What would it matter? I read Stalin's daughter's book. You might have read it, and you recall the passage. She was present when her father died. She said she has never seen such an expression of hate in her life. He was paralyzed on one side, and on the unparalyzed side, he raised the hand in an expression of anger. He couldn't have seen because the brain was gone, but he saw something not with the physical eye. He saw something and the response came out in a physical manner. Whatever he saw, she said, I've never seen such hate in my life as expressed on my father's face, as though the devil himself stood before him and he was simply defiant. He could have seen the composite picture of the 20 million that he slaughtered personified as one face facing him. And the hand, this little hand, raised in defiance. And then he collapsed and was gone. He didn't believe in the hereafter and he didn't believe that he would ever be restored. This was it, therefore. Do what you want. He looked upon the entire crowd standing on the podium with him and under his breath, when hundreds of thousands were cheering him, he would say, fools. He looked upon them, just as a cast of nothing. And yet today, we find all these silly people ballooning him up as an important person in this world. And he didn't care anything about anyone. Slaughtered, as he felt like it. But he has to face himself now and he's not playing the part of Stalin. He's playing, yes, the same being, but a young man, healthy and strong, strong enough to shine the shoes or clean the latrines or do something that's consistent with his life that is best needed to work upon him to bring out that something that is hidden in him, which he denied while he was here. So. I ask you to simply try it. Take the law. For those who are here for the first time, it's simple. This is what you do. Do you know what you want? 
Well, construct a scene in your imagination which would imply that you have realized it. Try to enter into the spirit of the scene and participate as an actor in the scene, giving as much of the tones of reality as you possibly can to the scene, giving it all of the sensory vividness that you are capable of giving it. Enter into the spirit of it and feel the reality of it, but go to the end. Don't consider the means, go to the end. The whole thing is already done and you are now reveling in the accomplishment and then break it. Now faith is simply loyalty to this unseen reality. That's what faith is, to remain loyal to this unseen reality. For when you did it, that was God in action. Who did it? If I ask you, you say, I did it. Well, that's his name. Who's doing it now? I am. Well, that's God's name forever and forever. So you do it in your imagination and then drop it. Just as he dropped the little gentle rain of crisp bills that fell upon him. And the boss comes in and tells him, you've been voted a 10% increase in salary retroactive to the first of the month. So his little problem was solved. And then the problem, which was a serious problem, for the mother and grandmother of the little girl that was solved. The doctors are still looking under their microscopes to see why they misinterpreted the first. And as they see the first, they will still come to the same conclusion. How did it happen? Well, it could not have happened, therefore it didn't. They'll be confronted with it, and still it didn't happen that way. It never was cancer, because it isn't cancer. For if it was cancer, there should have been some treatment, and there was no treatment. Therefore, it could not have been cancer. And they'll go over this over and over, like a squirrel in a cage, because it's only in our imagination. That's all that he did, and this man lives this way, morning, noon, and night. As he told me in his letter, when I first came to you, I thought you were the maddest person out of the insane asylum. I thought, really, you should be put away for the good of society, that you were stark mad. I really believed you were, but I was forced to try it, and so I tried it, and it worked. It didn't make sense, not any more than the promise makes sense. There's nothing more fantastic than the promise and it doesn't make sense. From a worldly point of view, it is completely incredible. But I tell you, it's true that buried in man is a plan, a plan of redemption in every man. And in the fullness of time, that plan erupts and all that is said of that man in the gospels, you experience. Then you know that man and that he wasn't here as an individual being. He simply was the plan who awoke in one being, whose name was, who knows. But the name of the plan is Jesus. Jesus is Jehovah. That's what the word means. It is I am. And so that is the being that is in every man. And every man is going to have the experience of Jesus Christ. There is not a bunch of little Jesuses running around. There is only one. So we are all gathered together, one by one, into the one body, the one spirit, the one Lord, the one God and Father of all. So that's what he said, that he would take us all together into the one, gather all into one being. Now that expression that is used in Ephesians, the first chapter, the root of that Greek word is head. So where do you gather it? In the head, for that's where it begins. You are buried there. You are crucified there, and you resurrect there. When you return, you return there from this external world. That's where you return. So you're gathered all together into this one state, and this gathering is the head. As though it's what Sir James Jean said, the more he studies this infinite universe, the more he has come to the conclusion 
that whoever the creator is resembles an infinite brain and we brain cells in the mind of the dreamer. So the brain cell is expanding forever and forever within the one brain. Now let us go into the silence. 